Welcoming to Rage Against the Mainstream Podcast for the first time. You may know him as Marcus Henderson, guitar god, but we know him as our new friend, Marcus. So I'd like to welcome you to the show. Hey, Bill. Good to talk to you for the first time. Yeah, right? It, we've definitely never done this before. <laughs> so for all of the listeners out there that don't know who you are, who are you and what do you do? Um, I am, uh, my name is Marcus Henderson. I am a dad, first and foremost. Um, I am a guitar player. All right, hold on. Every podcast or interview I do, um, he comes in and wants to say hi. So let's, let's get him in the, in the mix really quickly. This is my son, Orion. Nice to meet you, Orion. Okay. He's, he's, he's plugging his, his YouTube channel here. Um, <laughs> so, and, and you, you can't blame him. That's just rock and roll instinct. Hey, that, you can't teach that. That's the way you have to do it. The whole gorilla tactic. Sometimes it's the only way to do it. That's what I'm talking about. Look at him. Look at him weaseling his way into the back. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Oh my god! So um, so I am a I'm a I mean I'm a couple of things. It's it's hard to kind of define um exactly who I am because I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Let's just say that I am a video game session musician, video game designer, um, father of one. Um, I'm a guitar player, um, a drummer, a multi instrumentalist. And um, overall, fairly thoughtful human being. Awesome. I, I kind of like that. I like that description, that bio. You should put that as like your like Facebook or Instagram or something. Put it on top of my LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Hold on, dude. There he goes. <laughs> Subscribe to Orion's Galaxy. All right. <laughs> we'll put the plug um, in at the okay. end of the episode. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, um, that's that's pretty much the long and short of it. I had... Uh, sort of been internationally ignored most of my um, musical career until I um, was part of the creative team that worked on the first few Guitar Heroes. And uh, after that, I went on to work on a bunch of other games and, and other fun stuff too. But I, I think the one that kind of resonates most with people is definitely Guitar Hero. So how does that happen? Like, do you... Like, are you just like part of like an elite group of musicians that get a phone call to do something like this? Was it something you were already a part of or like, how did that whole process come like happen? So as it happened, um, it was a little bit of preparation and, you know, opportunity kind of collided at once. And, um, I'll tell, I'll tell the story. I'll try not to make it too long, but essentially, um, I've been a guitar player since, since I was roughly, I mean, 14 is when I got my first guitar, but I was around five or six when it, like, it absolutely dawned on me that I, that this is, this is what was chosen for me uh, as a, as a uh, instrument and kind of life path. And, um, I'd never been in a cover band, never been into, um, tribute bands or anything like that. I'd just been in a bunch of different local Bay area punk and metal bands. And, uh, I was jamming with a friend of mine, um, who invited us out to a beach party in San Francisco one night. And it's kind of California law that somebody has to bring an acoustic guitar to the beach. It's just, it's written in there. I, 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 I didn't write it. I just follow the rules. So I brought the acoustic out to the beach and with a combination of about uh, 11 beers and um, some other good stuff that was kind of floating around the fire. I, I, uh, I started playing some riffs, man, playing the rain song by Led Zeppelin. Basically somebody would call out a cover and say, Hey, play, um, in heaven, play back in black. And it was all just kind of this, you know, garden variety, you know, um, rock tunes that everybody knows. And I just, I just ripped through all of them. And, uh, I, it was almost like a, like a stump, the, um, stump the trunk kind yeah. of thing where people were throwing out like, you know, tunes for me to cover and uh, and I was nailing them like for what for whatever reason I've just had this ridiculous memory for um, for minutia for little tiny meta details that's that's been a blessing and a curse both both um, in my my personal life and in my professional career um, because I'm obsessed with detail like if I, I hear something and I'm like 
I want to know more. Like what pick was he using? What amp was he using? What tube grid was he using? What was the, what was the mixing board they were using? What were, uh, who, who produced it? What other stuff did he produce? Were they doing tape? Were they, were they reel to reel? Were they, was this at least this eight at what year was this? So, I mean, I, I just like, like sponge for information. So I just, I was playing at this beach party, um, reeled off a ton of songs. And at the end of the party, um, a guy named Bill, um, came up to me and gave me his card and he said hey we're always casting for people to do re-records uh for um commercials or for video games or for movies and this was an oscar nominated studio in the east bay called wave group and um i took his card and and i was like yeah no problem sure it sounds good i'd love to do it whatever never really done any session work prior to that just maybe a couple of things but i've always been recording like ever since i got like an elisa's um I, I mean, a Tascam four track. I, I'd record everything. A shoebox is full of demos. Just um, do it. I'd like do a, do a guitar cover of the Monday Night Football theme, or just like coming up with these weird conceptual things. Kind of like kind of what like what Buckethead does, which is just like record everything, just endlessly record. And and I did, and I got really good at recording. So I was given um, I was given a card, and I gave him my number, and kind of forgot all about it. And I got a phone call one morning. And uh, I mean, this is kind of a call that changed your life. So you don't really forget this kind of stuff. So I got a call from Bill and he said, hey, do you remember me? We we hung out at that party in San Francisco. Um, I gave you my card. Well, we're doing a um, for a video game coming up. They can't really tell you what the video game's about until you come in and sign the NDA. But I can tell you what the song is and what we need. And I'm like, well, sure. What do you, what do you need? And he says, well, we need somebody to do a note for note, like a 3D carbon copy of symphony of destruction by megadeth and like my like my whole body froze because i was like marty friedman is is in a echelon of of like awesomeness like unto himself i mean i i can cover angus young and i can approximate the bee sting vibrato and and i can i i know what it takes but marty marty just scared the shit out of me i mean still does right so um so he said in four days, come in, in on come come in on Tuesday at ten thirty. Um, we don't have any charts for you. We don't have anything, but we have a reference MP3 that we're going to email you right now. And I was like, okay, sounds good. So I'm listening to it, and it's thankfully not one of Marty's like crazier solos. It's a little, it's pretty straightforward, but still, I'd never really done anything like this, and it and it was it was really intimidating. Like, I mean. So I remember this, and I've told this story a couple of times because this is where like the divergent path occurs. Like I, this is where the road almost not taken happens. And um, without this, there's no Marcus n uh, involved with Guitar Hero. I'm sure it would have succeeded regardless. I mean, all the players on there were just like world class. But um, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for this phone call. And the phone call was, um, my d I decided that if this game paid less than $300. If this session paid less than $300, that it wasn't worth it because it was, it was a lot of work for me. And I was more intimidated by having to cover this song and, and to do this. Um, so I called up uh, Wave Group and I said, so I'm just curious. I know my session's coming up in a couple of days, but nobody told me what the rate is for this. Could you tell me what I'm getting paid? And remember, my cutoff was 300 And they said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We forgot to tell you. So you'll be getting a check for $350 at the end of the session. <laughs> See you then. <laughs> so, And I'm like, okay, great. So I hung up. So for 50 bucks, 50 bucks, I, um, I barreled through it. So I sat there. I, I listened to it. And at this time, I was using um, Line 6 gear, like all Line 6, the, the first Line 6 HD um, Flextone 2, or there's a Flexstone 1 amp. And so um, luckily you could just spin the dial and there's all these different amp models. So um, I, I found one that sounded pretty good and that already known a little bit about what, what Dave and Marty used back in the day. And it just so happened that I had a, a Stratocaster with a Seymour Duncan JD in the bridge, which is a huge part of that tone that had that, that nasal bite and that edge. Any guitar player listening will like nod their head like, yeah, I know what he's talking about. Um, so that's, that's a large part of that tone. I mean, I can, I can EQ in pretty much anything if I've got a good foundation for what the, the t distortion grain is going to be like. But the rest of it is just covering the genetics of Marty. Cause I mean, Dave didn't play a solo on that song and the rhythm guitar parts are just like uh, super rudimentary. Right? Exactly. So I, 
I go in there, um, I knock out the session. Um, I don't really think anything of it. And they, I sign the NDA and they say, okay, so this game is called Guitar Hero. And it's going to be a game where you play a plastic controller and you sort of like see these notes coming down at you and, and you kind of trigger the guitar parts. And it reminded me of a game that I had played when I was on tour in Vegas a couple of years before called Guitar Freaks. And it turned out to be like a clone of Guitar Freaks, which was a, um, a Japanese version of Guitar Hero with, with um, three buttons. My son just handed me this guy right here. So uh, Guitar Freaks was, um, was four buttons, really. And, um, and, and all these kind of like J-pop and all these kind of like uh, other, other kind of imagery. So I, I was familiar with it, but I didn't really think anything of it at all. I just kind of said, well, I'll play on this song, and this will be like the first and last session I ever do for a video game. And I'll have something to tell my grandchildren about, like later on in life. Like, hey, I, I played on a video game once. It was <laughs> called Guitar Hero. And um, so, so I did that session. They took that build to E3, and it came back with like half a dozen best in show awards, like best puzzle game, best rhythm simulator, all these other crazy things. And there was like a groundswell of buzz uh, for the game at that point, and it was starting to take notice. And so I got another call from Wave Group, and they're like, Oh, hey, so we wanted to let you know that your next song is Thunder Kiss 65, and you're due in on Tuesday at 1030. Um, check your email. We just sent you the song. See you then. And so I was like, well, all right, let's go. So I, that just th that led to, I think, 80% of the first game I did pretty much on my own. Um, so they just kept feeding me songs because I was knocking them out in, like, one day. I was like, I, I, I get it, like. Um, never really did super good um, in some classes at school, but when it came to that Guitar Hero session, the first one, um, something clicked. And that, well, yeah, just changed changed my life, man. Changed, <laughs> changed literally everything. Um, and all for 50 bucks. Yeah, right. That That's the most, like, insane, like, you know, uh, fork in the road type story I've ever heard. $50. $50. And I was committed to it because I was like, this song's a pain in the ass. Uh, I'm, I, I don't think I can accurately bend with the kind of um, microtonal commitment that Marty has. I was just, I was struggling with it. And, and any guitar player or any professional musician understands that confidence is literally everything. If you don't believe in yourself and you don't have a firm grasp on what you're trying to do, um, it can sink you. And it's, it started to kind of worm its way into my head. And, and um, I was like, well, well shit, I, I'm, I'm the only one I think that's that's capable of doing this at this crazy level of OD, o, o, OCD and ADD. Like, I I'm I just understood it. Like, I understood what the role was. I understood what the gig was. I was super super into it, and um, that they, they just kept feeding me songs one after the other and, until until we were done. And then uh, I got the I got the call um, after the first game came out that, and you mentioned, um, in a, in a previous conversation that there was a making of the video game video inside of the game. It's like the making of guitar hero. And, um, the publisher of the game, red octane came up to me and, um, they said, Hey, how would you like to do, um, something with us? Would you like to work for the game itself and, uh, do interviews and consult and help pick music? And, and that just like opened the entire Pandora's box. And it was crazy. Um, so yeah, that led to a full-time job with, with, uh, Activision while I'm recording Guitar Hero, um, and recording the music for my original band, Drist, at the same time. So, um, for the span of like two or three years, uh, I think I, I recorded somewhere between 50 to 60 songs. Um, and it was, it was very, very labor intensive and, um, I, I'd do it all over again if I could. Well, it's funny too, like the to hear you talk about recording at least those two particular songs. It's just like, um, when we first played the game, me and all my friends, like we, we weren't like super into music, like, like obviously like as we are now. And we didn't know the differences between like the real version and the guitar hero version. And we were, we were like dumbfounded. Like when the game was over and we're watching the videos, I'm like, Oh my God, like these people recorded this, like, this isn't, this isn't the real song. Like you guys had done such a good job that, I mean, granted we were like 14, 
but you guys fooled us. <laughs> yeah, and and it led to just an embarrassment of riches to be honest with you there was we won so many awards um but honestly this is the time where i have to like push away any of like my involvement and really talk about um the music director for that game um and and the, the owner of the studio and everybody else that worked there so i'm just going to take this opportunity and i'm going to i'm just going to say some names that you guys really should be talking about because um there were some just staggeringly talented people that worked on this game i think i got a lot of the a lot of the attention because i was loud brash i played did did a lot of the heavy lifting um but oh my god um just the, the team at wave group just some of the other players and the vocalists that worked on this game just just absolutely crushed it and still blow my mind to this day. So um, shout out to all the other guys. Like, I mean, Lance and, and Scott and, and even Lyle Workman, who does, you know, all the soundtracks for like 40 year old Virgin. He plays guitar with Sting. I mean, wow. these guys are just on an, another level altogether musically. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm like just this, this tiny little metal guitar player in their shadow, but um, they, they just, absolutely floored me with with how high they raised the bar for quality in this game that it made me like a way better player so i've always said look if you want to be a great guitar player if you want to be on that other level you have to surround yourself with people that are better than you they will raise your bar they will make you better and and then you'll hit that that like can i do this thing find out who you really are i mean you, you want to go punch below your weight limit go go play go play, you know, open mic nights or something. But if you want to, if you, if you believe in yourself, like I did with myself, if you knew your true calling was to do something um, that was going to change your life and hopefully make people happy, then you run to these opportunities, even if you're scared and you find out what's in you and, and you go kick as much ass as humanly possible. So thank you to all the other players in this game that I still like bow down to because they made me a better player straight up. So you had said earlier that uh, once you got on like the team with Red Octane and Activision, um, was there any particular songs for the next games that had come out that you had personally chosen? Oh, tons. Yeah. So so by the time Guitar Hero 2, I was working on Guitar Hero 2 while it was in production. So I came and sat down on the music selection committee uh, for Guitar Hero 2. And um, gosh, there's a bunch of those on there, too, that I did. Um, was there any that you absolutely needed to have? Um, yeah, uh, I remember doing, I mean, my favorite band of all time is Iron Maiden. And so I got to do uh, The Trooper from Iron Maiden. But then again, they cast players based on um, what was naturally in their musical wheelhouse. So, you know, they weren't exactly giving after, by the time Guitar Hero 2 hit, Wave Group had a really good understanding of, of who, who can do what really really well and my forte has always been like hard rock and metal so they had me doing i mean the, the last song i did on guitar hero one was um cowboys from hell so that was a pretty good idea of, of the kind of stuff that i'm i'm you know naturally able to gravitate towards so by the time gh2 came out i was doing i mean war pigs um uh, beast in the harlot by Avenged sevenfold oh my god there's a ton there's like i think there's a wikipedia page or something that's got all these songs out there i don't really remember all of them offhand but um if there was a a really super heavy tune um there's a there's a really good chance that i recorded it that's awesome so um let's move away from well actually hold on what other games were you featured on besides one and two so i did um encore the encore rocks the 80s come in Okay. Uh, when that came in and that was all kind of like hair metal stuff. And once again, they, they fed me the, the heavy stuff, you know, the, um, you know, it was like, um, balls to the wall, you know, like a couple, like there was an anthrax tune or so. Um, geez, I can't remember offhand. It's, it's been, I've it's just recorded so much music over my life. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to remember all of them, but, um, but yeah, the heavy, generally, generally speaking, the heavy stuff. And then, um, I did a lot of DLC for, um, for Guitar Hero 3, um, and then Rock Band, and then went off to to do some design work for some other stuff. But um, 
Yeah, at that point, by the time Guitar Hero 3 came along, unless it was something that needed a cover. <laughs> okay. Um, so by the time GH3 came along, um, they went to covers. I, I mean, they went to master tracks. So that was that was pretty much the end of my, my work doing re-records. And um, I feel like we successfully launched the balloon at that point. So... Um, you know, it wasn't super necessary to to do what we had spent so much time doing. We sort of played ourselves out of a job at that point. Yeah, which well, I was happy to. You know what I mean? Well, at that point, with the with the success of the first two three games, I guess at that point they knew it wasn't just like a novelty thing anymore, and this was something that was actually taking off. And people, you know, the 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 artists and management was probably like, well, we have to get a piece of ours now. Yeah, and I think what happened was is these um these these record labels were adamant about sharing as much music as possible because do you need to get by? Okay. Um so because what was happening is is there there was a residual effect of being involved in this game and it was it was selling music. And um, you know, people were buying classic rock. It was reinvigorating catalogs. I mean it it had such a significant effect on not only like music sales, but also guitar sales. Like there was a point where Best Buy was, was selling guitars mm -hmm. and there was a point where guitar center was selling guitar hero games. So there was like this seamless throughput um, where for a few years between 2006 and 2009, um, everybody was celebrating electric guitar mm -hmm. and it was just, it was just making so much money. It was ridiculous. And at that point, uh, the labels were like, here, here's our entire catalog. Just, just take what you need. And, um, and yeah, the game had become like a hundred, two hundred million dollar franchise at that point. So, um, it was completely self-sustaining and there was certainly enough money to get covers. The first couple of games were all, were all cover songs because just honestly, budgetary concerns, like, you know, Red Octane essentially mortgaged homes to pay for, the first game it was such a wide crazy gamble um to even launch guitar hero one so um it was really people people ask me well why didn't they use original master tracks on guitar hero one it's because they just couldn't afford it i mean music licensing is insanely expensive man it's something i still deal with when i work on games now um and it, it can be prohibitive in a lot of different ways so uh, it was sort of the perfect storm of, of necessity and the fact that you had um, a studio like Wave Group um, just capable of putting people in a position to succeed that that kind of made it all come together. Plus, I mean, let's let's bring harmonics into this, too, like their their art style, um, all of the, the level design, um, the, the note charts. They were just literally flawless. I mean, the first couple of games were just absolutely perfect. I mean. Guitar Hero 2 to me is as close to a perfect video game as you're ever going to get. And I've been I've been playing video games since literally Atari. Like <laughs> I go back to way way back. And now I mean we have every game system, PS2, 3, 4, 5, Switch, Wii, Genesis, Atari. We have literally everything. We're kind of a video game household here. Nice. And and it's just yeah, it, it just these things you can't manufacture this. It has to be like a very, very special confluence of events that makes it happen. And I was just really grateful that somebody recognized um, my level of nerdery and, um, and my, my, my ability on the electric guitar to, to be able to, to come in and do some work on it. I think it, I think it kind of turned out pretty good. So actually here's, here's a question. You obviously, you know how to play these songs. Are you able to successfully play Guitar Hero to the same proficiency that you can regular guitar? Ha, not at all. <laughs> so I'm really, really good at, 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 at where my fingers are. And the crazy thing is, even after recording Guitar Hero 1, um, my brain was saying, wait a minute, these motions are not accurate. Like my, thing, my muscle memory was taking me in a completely different part because... I, I was studying this, these songs so much and like just practicing so much that um, my, my fingers were going naturally to where they're supposed to be. So when you've got like a five button sort of like soft key reduction of these parts, um, my brain wasn't working in that way. Like my, my brain is trained to literally 
go to where they're supposed to be on a fretboard. So I, I'd be climbing the, the, this this plastic guitar, um, looking for things that weren't there. So um, I'm comfortable on medium. I think my my threshold was I would play every song, I'd play every game through on medium. But when it got to hard or expert, it just it wasn't fun for me because um, it, it it's that's kind of where I got off the spaceship, right? Like that, at that point, I realized that I mean this game is not for me it's not for for me particularly I'm just I'm just a custodian of of the rock to bring it to them um it is this belongs to everybody and and it was amazing just being able to talk to people about how they received the game and how much they celebrated the effect that it had on their life too I mean I'd go out and do clinics and I mean honestly I I I still get like fan mail and fan emails from people like quite a bit saying how, how it changed their lives. Obviously and, you're here. <laughs> I mean, right. And it's, I mean, like I, I'd go to, I'd go play at clinics and, and I'd have these moms coming up to me and they'd like, they'd say, can I give you a hug? And I'm like, well, sure, of course. So she'd give me a hug and she'd say, so I remember I'll give you two, two, two quick stories. One, one mom came up to me and hugged me and said, I just want to thank you for bringing my family together. And I'm like, I, Okay. I'm I'm grateful for anything that I did to bring your family to you. She goes, no, you don't understand. So like my teenager was fighting with his dad all the time and he would just go into his room and we were drifting apart and guitar hero showed up for Christmas and his dad introduced them to classic rock and they fell in love with this game and they bonded over this game and they are close again and now I'm at this guitar center here that you're doing a clinic at, and I'm buying him his first guitar. And I, I, I know he's going to be, I, I, we feel connected to him again. We have our family back and it's because of your game. And I was just like speechless. I like, I still get chills thinking about this. That's heavy. Cause man. I've right. And I've, I just felt like I don't want to take responsibility for any of this. I just want to be a part of something that brings joy to people's lives, man. I, like I said, I, I would be happy doing anything. Like, even if it was, I got to do, to do the spell check on the manual for the game. I would have been happy with that. <laughs> I just wanted to be, I just want to contribute in any small way to joy on this fucking planet. And that's, that's all I care about. Literally. And maybe it's the fucking Piscean empath in me that wants people to be happy but when people come to me and they're like, your game was such an overwhelming success that it, it, it brought my family together and now we have parties. And then the second, the second one I'll tell you was the one that really affected me. I was at a guitar center doing a clinic in, um, I think it was in Oklahoma or Nebraska. It was in Nebraska. And um, a, a guy came up to me and he said, hey, I just want to give you this. And he gave me this, this American flag patch. And he goes, this came off of my BDUs. I was I was stationed in Afghanistan, and we were going out on combat missions literally every night, and we were seeing heavy, heavy shit. And you don't know, but we had Guitar Hero in our barrack, and all we wanted to do was go out and come back alive for another night of Guitar Hero. Like your contribution to this game brought us so much joy that it gave us something to look forward to while we were in the middle of the worst thing that you'll ever experience in your life. So he gave me the, the flag patch off of his BDUs when I, st I still have it to this day in, in, in my little safe. And it's, and it's, just, it, I was, I'm still speechless. I like it affected everybody in, in such a, such a crazy way and and just to be able to say that i helped bring them a little bit of joy in the middle of probably what is what is going to be some of the worst thing that they ex experienced in their entire life is it's just i don't even know what to say man that's you know, insane just, just, yeah and and i know that there's plenty of other stories like that because because i've gotten them I've, I've gotten so much mail from people that that share their experiences with me and i think I think I'm kind of one of the right people to share these experiences with me because I'm such a fan of, of rock and, and metal music too. And, and metal and rock has always been super inclusive. Like we can see somebody wearing a, a Sabbath or a Slayer shirt. It's like Slayer. We all, 
we are a brotherhood. We are a family. We are all together connected through this. And, and to, to, sh- to hear these stories and to be able to say that I, in some small way, brought them a little bit of happiness is, is just that, that brings me more joy than anything. I don't care about the money. I don't care about, I don't care about being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I don't care about the, the, the signature models or all of the other shit. It doesn't matter to me. The only thing that matters is the fact that this world sucks so goddamn much sometimes. And people are so selfish and so crazy goddamn self-centered that to be able to, 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 to bring just a little bit of happiness to anybody, it just, it, it just matters so much to me, man. So um, that's my takeaway. So what did I get out of this? I got to, I got to make people happy. And that, that was, that's the most important thing to me. That, like, I don't even know like how to like, I don't know how to, uh, like rebuttal that, like that, like that was like, uh, that's like a, like a presidential type speech type of thing where it's just like, you know, the standing ovation and the, the crowds of people clapping. <laughs> Dude, I, awesome. I honestly, I'm just, I am just a, a servant of metal and the kind of, the kind of stuff that I saw, you know, early on in my life, it, 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 it was a gift to me to be able to, to play guitar at this level. Like, to be able to to do this, it's 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 not taken for granted. So, um, you know, I feel like in some ways I'm kind of an ambassador to the instrument, and um, you know, just a, a torch holder for rock and metal. Because to us that need this, we know how important this is. So, um, everybody has that responsibility. I just I just was put in a really really unique position um, to do it on, on on a game that that helped bring a lot of people together. And, and that's, that's one of the most important things that's ever happened to me. And honestly, and I mean, being, being a father to my kids, like th- that's my primary objective. It's, I mean, just being a dad, being that's, that's everything taking care of people. I just, that's all I want to do. So, um, yeah, super grateful, man. Changed everything. So you said you had worked on like rock band and a couple other games. I wanted to touch base on the um, the Unplug game that's being oh, yeah, promoted yeah, yeah. now. So, for for those that don't know what it is, could you give a little bit of explanation about this game? Yeah, essentially, Unplugged is um, Guitar Hero for VR. Basically, it's um, the same game mechanic as Guitar Hero, but instead of holding a controller. You're using the hand tracking cameras on the on the Quest or whatever, whatever um, you know VR headset you're using, and um, when you put on the headset, you will see your hands, and you will pick up a virtual Schecter guitar, and you will see notes coming at you just like in Guitar Hero, and you strum the air, uh, which activates the part, um, and it's basically just a rhythm game like Guitar Hero. Um, I I was was plucked out of out of nowhere to be able to help get this game off the ground and, and kind of bring the, the same fun and the same kind of feeling of playing Guitar Hero to a brand new platform. And it's it's been tremendously exciting. The game's um, making, you know, making an impact on people in VR spe- specifically. And um, But essentially, it's it's still the same kind of thing, only um, you're not holding a, a controller. You're, you're just kind of holding air. So um, it's air guitar. Um, it's air guitar hero, basically. Do you feel like it's any easier than regular guitar hero? Um, it is in certain ways because guitar hero was in a lot of ways, um, a game about dexterity, right? And when you got past, you know, the, the, the first couple levels, um, it became a note storm, Right. And you see people play it and they just do incredible things, especially like the score hero dudes that are just doing otherworldly insane guitar stuff. parts. <laughs> yeah. It's just mind blowing how good people are on guitar hero now. But um, unplugged is a different kind of animal because the nature of the technology doesn't really allow for like individual fingerings like that per se. Um, unplugged is really chordal based. So you're kind of just moving your hands in chord clusters. So in that respect, it's a lot easier because you don't need to sight read a zillion notes. You just need to sight read um, 
fingering changes and positional changes as it as it were. So it's it's easier, but still in its own way very difficult because unplugged unplugged has a has a difficulty um, spike, which is um, made to compensate for the fact that the tech doesn't really allow for individual fingering so much, right? So you have to get really creative on how you level up or scale up the difficulty from like the first mode, which is easy peasy all the way to expert, which is just like, Oh my God, just, you're deluged with, with chord clusters and, and movement. And um, it's a little bit different in the note charting philosophy as well. Guitar hero was very predictable. If you saw a part in the chorus that did da, 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 um, that repeated every chorus. So you kind of knew where to go if you played through it once Unplugged is a little looser with its uh, note charting philosophy. So you will be not necessarily repeating certain parts. You'll be just kind of like going along with um, the note chart um, or the, the designer's whim to make it more challenging so that the game isn't something that you play through within five minutes and then you're tired of it. I mean, you have to scale it up so it gives even like the serious players something to work for. So it's a completely different animal, but very, very familiar at the same time. And the music is just as awesome. So one of the things that I brought to it was, um, well, let's activate fan bases of huge bands that really, really love these, the, this, this music because that'll get their fan bases excited. And if we can get Ozzy's fan base excited about playing Flying High again and Unplugged, chances are a percentage of them will go out and get a headset and play the game. Um, same thing goes for Rush. Same thing goes for, you know, Tenacious D and, and Slayer and Pantera and all the other brands that I sort of like push through because I, I know, you know, after putting out a ton of these video games, um, what it takes to kind of get people excited about the content and the content really drives the game itself. Now, are these uh, if I, I saw the trailer for the Pantera one. Are these sound packs that you just buy? Well, you would buy them in like the PlayStation Store or whatever, and add them into the game. Yeah, essentially, um, you you just you can buy them directly through the game itself. Like you, you do it, and it'll you know everything on Meta or Oculus, whatever, is connected through um, an app. So you basically you can buy everything through the app, and it'll it'll upload to your headset and, and do that there. So um, and this and the the thing about um, Meta games are they they are not super expensive your average you know for comparative purposes we have a ps5 these games are 70 dollars, right um br games are like 20 30 bucks because they're they're not as big the budgets to make them aren't as big and um they're the tech around these headsets is is not necessarily what's going to be inside of a um a playstation 5 you know these these are these are supercomputers that we're dealing with now. And the games on current gen consoles are nowhere near like maxing the capability of, of what the software can offer. Like it takes a while for games to really get to that level. Um, but since the tech behind these headsets is um, scaled down to a degree, it makes it a little bit easier to make games for them. So that's why when you see VR games, you're not seeing Grand Theft Auto on them. It's because they're, they're just, the chipsets aren't really necessarily geared for that kind of stuff yet. You know what I mean? We're still kind of, I mean, Oculus too. I mean, think about it. We're still kind of like in the early stages of VR as a, as a platform, Yeah. you know, that that's insane. So it's not, it's not a console game. I see. I, other than guitar hero and like grand theft auto occasionally and Gran Turismo. I love Gran Turismo. I'm not a I'm not a gamer by any means or any stretch of the imagination. I still have a PlayStation 3. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you have it because you actually like video games. I have it because I don't know any better. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could play them more. To be honest with you, the crazy thing about, um, you know, the more time you put into to work and family and, and all the other extracurricular stuff that I do is... Um, I only really get to play with my son, Orion, every so often, but he's on it all the time. I can look over. He's on a switch right now. So he's always he's always playing and he gets to enjoy it. Um, I get to sit in every so often, um, but I can always justify owning them because I'm trying to get games that I work on onto these platforms. Um, but uh, right now it's still it's still like a, a very, very small percentage. A game like Unplugged, 
would work great on PlayStation VR. I mean, it, it would be amazing. Or, or, or Apple VR or any of them, yeah. Um, but still, like, the, the consoles themselves are far more complicated than your average VR headset. So what are you, uh, what are you up to now? What's the, uh, what's the latest in, like, what are you, what are you doing? Well, lately, um, I'm, we're working on more content for Unplugged. So I'm re-recording some stuff with, um, the sound design team behind one of the games that's out on Vertigo right now. Uh, Vertigo Games is the company that I work for and we are working on some music, uh, to just bring new um new kinds of orchestral or video game music into unplugged that isn't just your standard three to four minute rock song so um currently doing re-records uh bracing myself for my son to go into fifth grade next week um trying to find time to play the electric guitar on my own um just 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 to have fun but uh aside from that always always working always playing always just I, I can't sit still, man. I'm like, I'm always kind of doing something musical. You know, we, we've got a drum set over here that I pound, pound out on an occasion, but uh, yeah, it, the, the beat never stops, man. Like as long as I have a breath in my, my body or, um, you know, speed in my hands, I, I'm, I'm pushing it to the, as far as I can go. So is there any original projects that you're in the middle of right now, or is everything else just kind of on hold? No, I, I, well, I'm, I've been in the same band for like 20 something years. Um, and we're supposed to re-record like an EP coming up. So I wrote a, a couple of songs for that and submitted them to the lads, but, um, yeah, just, just trying to, I've said like a thousand projects going on at once. I mean, I have like three hard drives full of demos that I, 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 I told myself that I'm going to release someday, but then I listened to it. And I'm like, Oh, I don't want to release anything half-assed. And then, I've had this idea to go back and take all my shoebox demos from the nineties and, and either re-record those or port those to digital and release them. I mean, I don't even have a fucking website right now. Like I, I'm just like, I'm not even interested in like, you know, selling t-shirts with my face or name on it. It's like, I, I'm not interested in just monetizing anything that unnecessary. I don't need to, to push my existence into people's faces I just, I just want to continue doing good work and, um, and, and please myself. Like I'm my own harshest critic. Like, and, and honestly, that's what got me through like every guitar hero session. Like I am obsessed with as high of a level of perfection that I can get. So when you say that those songs are just like carbon copies or they sound super good, well, we won a ton of awards because I was literally obsessive over stuff. Like I remember there was one song I recorded um, and I felt like utter crap. I recorded one song for Guitar Hero 2. I think it was Trippin' on a Hole in a Paper Heart. It was a Stone Temple Pilots cover. And I, I just, I didn't feel like I had a great day in the studio. I just, I was, I just wasn't feeling it. And, and, and I'm only human, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not a robot, right? So I remember they gave me my check for $350 and I didn't cash it because I, I didn't feel like I earned it. Like I just, I didn't feel good about it. I was just like, I didn't, I didn't deserve this. So it just, it literally just sat there for a while. And then I came back um, the next week for pickups and they were like, you only have like two or three things to, to clean up, like just a few things. And then I listened back and it was like, I can't remember. It was, it was almost perfect. So I, I'm like really, really hard on myself. And I think anybody that demands to find that extra gear in themselves or demands that whatever they're doing is not good enough. Make it better. Like find a way, push yourself to another echelon because if you're not going to do it, somebody else will. And, and what was crazy was at that point, I was well aware that what I was doing by, by the time guitar hero twos, the middle of guitar hero twos tracking session, I became self-aware that I'm doing something that's not only going to change my life, but I'm also doing something that if I, decided to mail it in or or start reading my own interviews or listening to how amazing I am from other people that if I let any ego get in the way of this and I start slacking off or lose that edge or lose that hunger 
somebody will come in and replace me like that. Like there are so many amazing guitar players in California to think that I was the guy that did this is just mind blowing. I mean, so I was, I just stayed hungry. I was just like, nobody is taking this gig from me. Like, this is mine. I understand why they hired me for this. I understand what I'm supposed to do. I get it. And I'm not giving this up. Like, you're going to have to rip the guitar from me or you're going to have to like throw me down a flight of stairs to keep me from obsessively demanding something more from myself. And all of that energy that I pulled out um, made those songs what they are. And then Guitar Hero 2 went on to win a bunch of Best in Show awards and a bunch of Game of the Year awards. And we won the 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 soundtrack of the year for the, the Spike TV video game awards. And, you know, a couple of months after that, I'm at, I'm at like Vin Diesel's after party at, in, <laughs> in Hollywood and, and Seth MacFarlane is drunk and, and I'm like, I'm carrying him off while the guy from Borat is right over here, like buying me a drink. And, and we were like the toast of the town. We were like, Oh my God, guitar hero. Oh my God. You're the guitar hero guy. <laughs> and I'd go into GameStop and people are like, are you the guitar hero guy? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm that, that's me. So, um, so three things, man, it, I stayed humble. I stayed hungry and I demanded like nothing short of the absolute best that I could pull out of my, my, my body and my heart and my soul for this game. And, and all of that contributed with all the hard work that everybody put into it is the, kind of the only reason why this game made it. Um, you cannot reproduce that level of care. There's no substitute about giving a crap about what you do. None. Exactly. And it's just, um, <clears throat> it's just so funny because people usually don't like look at the extra stuff or like the behind the scenes stuff. I, I like get off on that stuff. I love all the behind the scenes stuff. And you know, we used to watch, we used to just watch them just for fun. Like we wouldn't even play the game anymore. We just watch, we watch the same, I think it was like four videos and we just keep watching them like over and over again. Just like, I like, we can't believe these people actually exist. And the one that always blew our minds was when um, they do the close up on you playing the Cowboys from hell solo. And like, where's like, Oh my God. Like that. Then I think your face wasn't in it or something. And we're like, yeah, they, they had to get die back. They had to get die back. This is, this is legit. <laughs> yeah. So it, the crazy story with, with CFH was um, all the tracking was done for guitar hero one. Like everything was done. It was in the can. And then, um, I guess Harmonix had a last minute song and that last minute song was CFH. And so wave group said, um, Hey, do you got one more in you? And I'm like, of course, what do you got? And they're like, Cowboys from hell by Pantera. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So now you got to think about this was in 2005. I was recording this game. Um, you know, the incident in Al Rosa Villa happened, you know, the previous year. And that still stuck with me. Like it was really, 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 really like in burned into my heart and soul that I am now honoring dime in a way that, that has to be done accurately. So it was the longest session that I'd ever done for any guitar hero song. And uh, it took two days to do. Wow. Two days to do because um, I had to be Rex too. So th the crazy thing about that was, I had to play the, I had played the bass on that song too. Cause they, they were like, we don't have anybody to do this. You have to do this. We have two days to do this song and we have to deliver it to harmonics. So, um, I played, I played the bass. Then I did all the rhythm tracking in one day. And then I came in on a Saturday and we did the solo. And I remember I had dimes and I still have it in my phone. I had, it's, it'll say dime cell in my phone. Like I've never taken that. And I've had like, 14 iPhones since that, right? And I had his phone number in my phone. And Rita, whom I've grown to become close with over the years, left his cell phone on for people to leave messages uh, on years after. And I remember before that session, I took a couple of seconds and I just called Dime Cell. And I, I left this like, I was almost crying. I was like, Dime, I'm about to go in and do something that I think a million and a half people are going to be hypercritical of if I screw this up. I'm just saying, man, give me that black tooth kiss from above and get me, get me some energy so I can get through this and do this the right way. And, um, 
and Rita has just been super grateful uh, over the years about how how much. And I've been in, I've been invited. I played dime bashes before because um, I've just I've been I've been a, a a Pantera and Dime fan. Dime's like the greatest metal guitar player in, ever. Like, Without me, a I mean, doubt, you you can say Randy Rhodes, whatever you can say, and 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 Saint Rhodes is is always there. But for everything that Dime represented, there they broke the mold. There will never be another Dime bag, not even close. Like, it was just so that's pure, it. so pure so aggressive so much confidence so much power so much tone just so much so much balls and gravitas that it's like you you just it's it's a once in a generation type guy like they don't they don't make them like that anymore and so i had to be that guy like and i'm not that guy dime is that guy i'm not that guy like <laughs> if i was that guy i'd be dime so I got to be that guy. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, let's, let's, let's do this, man. And so, um, I've always known that I, 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 I can play. I mean, everybody had been telling me since I was a kid that I can play and I'd always had kind of confidence, but I'd never really had to show it on that level. Right. I mean, you can be real, real, real kick-ass guitar player in, in your backyard. Um, but when it comes to playing for the, for the world, for literally billions and billions and billions of people, it's a different story. It's the biggest stage and, in the world. And it's it. And I mean, that it's unquantifiable how many times that song has been played on this planet through that game. I mean, people are still playing it right now, yeah. like every year for the forever. So um, I had to get it done and I had to get it right. And um, I feel like, to the best of my ability at that time, I did it as much service as I could. And, um, and we, we, uh, I think we pulled it off. Now going back to Pantera for a second, um, obviously it's no new news to anybody that, you know, his fans of either of this show or a Pantera that the Pantera reunion news came about. How do you feel about this? All right. So, it's a really weird line that I'm straddling with this because on one hand, I want to see new generations of people rediscover or for the first time hear Pantera. Mm -hmm. um, and Pantera is a legacy band and their music will, will last forever. Um, but Pantera to me has always been Vinny and Dime straight up. And I mean, not to say that Phil and Rex weren't, you know, a, a huge part of it. I mean, Rex is Rex. Rex was literally the inspiration for Steve Buscemi's character in Airheads. I mean, he, he in and of itself is an icon. And Phil is Phil. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Benante is one of the greatest metal drummers of all time. And Zach Wilde is actually a friend of mine. He, he, he sent me my, my black label colors um, about 10 years ago. I have the vest and everything. And That's so awesome. I, I'm, I'm BLS worldwide too, man. I I'm right there with it. So on one hand, I support getting the music out there. On the other hand, I feel like it's kind of a weird thing to not have the brothers, but I think if they do this with the right amount of love and the right amount of respect, and I'm talking like giant projectors with nonstop images of why this band even exists. And that's, that's images of Dime and, and Vinny everywhere. If, if their legacy is included with it, and I know their hearts are in the right places, um, I, I, I think that it can, it can do what it's supposed to do, and that's spring Pantera uh, to people who need it the most. Mm -hmm. I, I agree 100%. I mean, there, it's crazy to see the comments on social media and on you know Facebook and Instagram, like, I can't believe they would do this, and this is a cash grab, and it's just like, what these people aren't, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe because I'm like a giant Zach Wild fan or maybe because I do a little bit of research, him and Dime were boys. Like, he's not going to go out and do a disservice to his best friend. You know what I mean? Oh, my God. Give me one second, Bill. I'm going to put on my colors, man. <laughs> right on. I'm putting on, I'm, I got to wear, I got to rock my colors. I don't know. Somewhere over there, I bet. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, uh, hold on, hold on. Coming in hot. Oh. All right, hold on. There we go. All right. There you go. Damn. Get you, get you pool. <laughs> See, I, I have like or had a couple bucket list interviews. One was you. One was Zach Wild, and the other one was Eddie Van Halen. Obviously, I'm not getting Eddie Van Halen, but I got you. And then my next, my next, uh, like uh, plateau is going to be Zach Wild. I, I'm like, re- I'm relentless with it. But um, yeah, Father it, Zach's a great interview, man. I'm sure he he just, I mean, reach out to his Barbara. I think manages his wife man, manages him. She's awesome too. Yeah, because um, he's a yeah, Jersey boy Father too. Father Zach's great. Yeah, no, I mean, Father Zach's amazing. I got to, here's a killer story. Like, I mean, one of my favorite, favorite things ever was um, I got to go to Zach's house one time and I got to just, I got to to just hang out with him pretty much all day long. And he let me play every guitar. I played the grail. Um, oh, man. I, I, I mean, he had, he's got like a million Les Pauls like everywhere. I mean, Roswell Rhodes, original Roswell Rhodes. It was just like so many killer guitars, man. But um, I got to play the Target guitar. I got pictures of me playing the Target guitar. And he goes, Father Marcus, calls me Father Marcus. Father Marcus, I want you to play this for me here. Hold on to this. And he hands me Randy Rhodes' Les Paul. Like Randy Rhodes' actual Les Paul. The <laughs> Randy Rhodes' Les Paul. And, and he took a picture of me kind of kissing the guitar. And I like I still get chills thinking about it. And, and he had... Um, he had the uh, the polka dot V two right there, the original. So I, I got insane. to play Randy's Les Paul. I mean, just mind blowing. Not for, many for people like can say kid. that. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I was I was that metal kid, like literally that metal kid. I was telling Orion the other, my son Orion. I was telling Orion, uh, was it last night? I was telling him that I um I had a Aussie T shirt. No, it was, I, I bought an, uh, my mom bought me an Aussie t-shirt and a, and a maiden t-shirt when I was 10 years old. And it was the peace of mind cover. And I wore the peace of mind cover to school for the first time. And I got sent home 20 minutes later. So as a metalhead kid, you know, there's always that metal kid, that metal kid. And uh, to be able to you know, di- 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 Diary of a Madman is on my wall right here. It's like, I mean, just to be able to play that guitar. Yeah, that's nuts. The guitar, it's just, it still, it blows my mind to this day. So, um, yeah, I mean, when I talk about embarrassment of riches, it's it's just, I, I can't believe how un- incredibly lucky I- I've been in for people like Zach to recognize, you know, um, what I've done or whatever and to share. Because, I mean, that's, that's how these tales get told, right? We we pass metal on to the next generation. That's what yeah. that's my son's named Orion, like literally named after Cl- Cliff's instrumental. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> I was going to ask you if there was a correlation between the two. Of course there is. Yeah, and I got to meet uh, Ray Burton at Nam a couple of years ago, and oh wow! And, um, I told him that that my son's named Orion after you know we were gonna we were thinking about naming him clifford lee but i mean he was orion is an orion and and so ray wrote this beautiful thing um this this autograph picture of of cliff and it says to orion you have the greatest name ever and you are blessed with all these abilities so i i am just just waiting for the day that um that uh he hopefully picks up the mantle too orion's got guitars he's got basses he's got a drum set so um i'd say that uh, Zach Wild's kids, you know, his, his kids' names are uh, Hendrix and um, Sabbath and Page. You know, those kids represent the next generation of metalheads. And um, yeah, bring, bring, starting them early here, Bill. Yeah, right. <laughs> so that's, but that's how it survives, man. We pass it on. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, I think with also with the newer generations getting back into vinyls. And stuff like that, them becoming more popular, I think, and especially with, uh, like, uh, I hope you've seen the newest uh, season of Stranger Things. You can't be the only person oh my that God. hasn't. Dude, dude, <laughs> we, it is the, so we haven't seen, 
the last episode. We're actually oh on my the God. final episode of season four. Now we we've been avoiding spoilers, but we're all very very well aware of, of what, what Eddie does. <laughs> what where is he's wearing a straight? He's wearing brochachos. Oh, right nice. <laughs> And and uh, yeah, I got this. I got the Hellfire Club shirt. My, you know, of course. Um, so yeah, man. I mean, anything that promotes uh, our 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 lifestyle music, anything that brings metal into the forefront or gets anybody excited about anything, there's no gatekeeping in metal. It's like, welcome to the party. Glad you finally got here. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's just such a it, it's it's an amazing community, and it even comes to a point to where it doesn't even matter like what particular genre or subgenre of metal that you like. It's just all one giant thing. Yes. I mean, there's, there's so many amazing documentaries. I'm, I, I am, I mean, fiend for like information. Like I love documentaries, but particularly like metal documentaries are, are my favorite. You know, the, the Vakken documentary is amazing. Murder in the front row get thrashed the story of anvil my favorite of all time which i've seen at least um, 200 times is uh decline of the western Civil- civilization part two the metal years um and even part one the punk years because before i was a metalhead and and i was i've been a metalhead since you know i 10 um i was concurrently into punk too right because they're they're kind of close coast close cousins in a lot of different way so anything about punk or metal um, I, I, I just, I absorb. So yeah, it's just, it, it, the commonality in a lot of these things is that metal is for everyone. And if, if you're, you're either with us or against us, but if you're with us, you're with us for life. And this, this, this family, no matter, it doesn't matter what color you are. doesn't matter what you look like. You don't have to have long hair. It just, you have to have metal in your heart. And that's all that matters, man. Yeah. That's amazing. So, I, I mean, th- this is kind of like one of the longer interviews that I've done. Like, it's just like, it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to like talk like this. It's nice. Um, I guess I want to get into your guitar playing. Like, we talked a lot about Guitar sure. Hero, but I want to talk about like the real deal. Where, well, what are some of your influences in playing? Like, obviously, like with uh, background in punk and metal and, uh, you know, Zach Wilds, Randy Rhodes, uh, yeah, Zach Wilds, Zach Wild, Randy Rhodes, like those type of guys. Dime, what um, what were some of your early influences in playing? Oh, Angus Young, um, yeah, Angus Young was one big time. I remember um, we, you know, my 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 dad gave us my brother and I his old stereo system. It was an eight track cassette player, and uh, I had the eight track for for those about to rock. We salute you. And I would, I loved that intro. And we used to listen to that song relentlessly. And if you remember four tracks, if you're listening out there, um, eight track cassette players, you had to like, you had four programs. So if you wanted to hear the first song on the first uh, the album again, you had to go all the way to the fourth one, fast forward that so it back over to the first one. And we wore that tape out. And I remember um the day that we bought back in black on on vinyl my brother and i pooled our he had five bucks i had five bucks we went and and stood in line and and bought uh the the back in black album uh we bought two albums that day we bought aldo nova um life is just a fantasy remember that life is just a fantasy can't you and then we had a back in black on the same day and i'll never forget that so angus was a huge influence on me um space space ace freely of course oh my god um but as i as i grew a little bit older i started gravitating towards um sort of unsung hero dudes that um to this day are like some of my favorite players i mean stefan edgerton from descendants is one of my favorite guitar players of all time um east bay ray from dead kennedy's is one of my favorite guitar players jakey lee is one of my favorite guitar players Talk about unsung hero um, yeah right oh my god and um geez man because like brad gillis from night ranger i i remember hearing a night ranger cassette and i was like who's this guy i mean no one ever talks about brad no and then and then um oh geez like this is the crazy thing I, i just get this 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 paralysis when i talk about influences because like 
like a million of them come rushing into my head at once, but it's never guys like Jimi Hendrix or, you know, I, 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 I just, I didn't give, I didn't care about, about the Beatles too much. Cause I mean, these were my parents' bands, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? So, and, and when you're a young kid, you're like, I, I just want to rock. I want things to be aggressive. So uh, Tom Scholz from Boston, because he had that sound and that sustain and, and that, that pick slide still to that day, that, that laser pick slide, there's nothing like it on earth. And, and I know what's going to happen is, is immediately after this, I'm going to remember like for the guys that I always tell myself, make sure you remember to mention this guy in interviews or, or podcasts. <laughs> and I never do. So uh, I'll, I'll have to, Oh God, it's just, 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 just so many, but um yeah, I mean, really the big heavy hitters, the guys that are like fire starters for me were pretty much Angus Young, um, Ace Fraley, and um, from there, like, you know, James Hetfield, Kirk Hammett, these guys like took over. And then when I started getting into technical guitar playing, um, it was a sa- there was a sound page in Guitar Player Magazine, and it was, it was Racer X. It was... Bruce Bouillet and Paul Gilbert, and the song was Scarified. So back in the day, back in the mid-80s, Guitar Player Magazine had this little flimsy plastic record that would come in, and you'd tear it out, and you'd put a nickel on it to weigh it down. And it, would, it was called The Sound Page. And there was a sound page for Scarified and um, some other song. And I heard Scarified, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, like 90 light bulbs went off in my head. I'm like, I want to do that. <laughs> I want to do that. I want to be that good. Um, Greg Hetson from Circle Jerks was another one, and I might I might remember him as I come, and as I come, I might just like <laughs> shout him. Oh yeah, this guy. But That's um, all good. Yeah, a lot of dudes that you wouldn't ordinarily necessarily think would would influence a dude like me because it never was just like oh it's only Ingve and and Randy Rhodes and Eddie Van Halen, but Eddie Van Halen's like one of my favorite guitar players, like the perfect rock guitar player of oh. all time. Eddie Van Halen's the guy that you listen to and you like, you just you just don't do anything because you're just, every phrase is going to be something incredible, right? Yeah, I every mean, phrase out does the last. You can, amazing. you can make any argument for Eddie Van Halen. I, I mean, I do it literally on almost a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Eddie, if there's one thing I took away from Eddie was just the fluidity of his phrasing, mm-hmm. just the way he puts uh, and, and solo construction, things that I would identify later on in, in, in my analytical mind as like, um, what is really going on here? And that was like a deep dive into to what exactly is playing in it. And it wasn't because Eddie had this encyclopedic knowledge of scales or chords or whatever, um, because I, I've been a part of two books, a full length instructional video uh, and a ton of videos on guitarinstructor.com and everything. Um, and, and Eddie's playing simplified really isn't, isn't that mind blowing from a, from like a, a theoretical perspective. It's the phrasing. It's, it's the intent. It's the attitude. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's unprecedented and it's liquid. He, he is just a purely liquid electric. It's, it's liquid electricity and they'll they'll never be anything like it. And the tone. (laughs) That tone. Oh my God. Yeah. No, you're talking, now you're getting into it because Cause that's where I started geeking out big time going back to his very act Marshalls. Mm-hmm. And then when he switched over to the Saldano SLO 100 and what that was a clone of, and then how that begat like the boogie, rev- you know, the, the, the rectifying revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I could, I could literally go for hours on this stuff. As you can tell, I'm a fan Halen. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Me too. I got to meet Wolfgang. Um, last year and uh, I gave him a, I gave him a headset and a copy of unplugged and said, let me know if mammoth ever wants to be a part of it. That's awesome. That his, his album's actually really, really good. I, I wasn't right. sure what to expect when, when it first was talked about. Cause you know, that I remember like watching like the, the Eddie Van Halen Smithsonian, like in uh, his introduction to the Smithsonian. And he was like, wait until you hear his album. It's good. And it's like, well, that could just be a dad talking. And then I actually heard the entire album and I was like, oh my God, like he was like, like he brought it. And it's like, well, of course he did. Look who his dad is. Right. And he was a, he was a super humble, nice dude too. That was the cool thing about Wolfgang was, um, he's rock royalty, but he was, he was like really, really humbled and grateful. He's like, oh my God, nobody gives me like VR headsets while I'm on tour. So (laughs) 
um, super amazing dude. And uh, yeah, um, I, I wish him and Mammoth like all the luck. I, I swear to God, he he doesn't need it. I mean, he's, the DNA is there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, last thing about Van Halen is the um the thing that most people overlook is the rhythm playing like his his rhythms are just they're they're impeccable like yeah of course he's he's got all the flashy tapping and harmonics and all, all that but at the base of it he is a rock solid rhythm player with a groove and a feel like no one else has ever had or ever will have yeah, and I think a lot of that came from two really distinct advantages that Eddie had growing up. One, his dad was a professional musician. Um, and the other, he started out on drums. So he actually had that kind of basis for for developing that inner meter that I think translated into just that golden right hand. I mean, his rhythm playing is is unlike anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's they say tone is in the hands, but I mean, I mean, what an understatement for Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you listen to songs like uh, like Romeo Delight off Women and Children First and like Mean Street, like they're just like locked in like solid riff, you know, just like a solid groove and it just doesn't move. But um, right. And, and I think a lot of that, too, is is playing with your brother, you know, 400 hours a day. Yeah, you know, right. <laughs> that's there's no I mean, there's like you can't substitute that like getting that connection is, is one thing, but like just endlessly practicing. And this is before Instagram or, or Nintendo switches or anything. You didn't have any of that stuff. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie and his family really didn't have any money when they came over here. If I remember correctly. So like five all they had on a was, piano. Right. And all they had, was each other and, and, you know, a beat up drum set and, and that old guitar. And I mean, that's what you did. Mm-hmm. Right. But so, I mean, if, you're, you're going to eventually get good. It's like what, you know, uh, you know, Willie Adler said about his brother. He's like, yeah, you're going to be an amazing drummer if you practice 700 hours a day for 40 years. I mean, it's just, it's going to happen. So there's no substitute, like I said, for, for just for digging in and, mm-hmm. and putting in the hours. You just, I, I, I put in a zillion hours on guitar. It, it, when there was nobody even watching, nobody cared a, a damn thing about me. I didn't care. I was obsessed and you have to have that. You have to be obsessed. Yeah. It just, there's you're, or you're not going to get anywhere. I do remember a point in time picking up a guitar world magazine and seeing an, 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 an ad with you in it for an Epiphone, the, the apparition. And I got to play that guitar one time at a guitar center and it was absolutely incredible. And of course, being a broke kid, I wasn't able to get that guitar but I wanted to tell you it was one of those uh, like life changing moments. <laughs> Man, thank you. the The apparitions that I still have, um, they they just they play and sound amazing. I was, I mean, look. So when I was a kid, my biggest dreams were um, being Guitar World magazine. Like that was my biggest dream, just being Guitar World. Even if they mentioned my name, just like just a little blurb, I was like, I've done it. Spike the football. I'm done what else can I do? Right. I mean, and then, and then Epiphone basically gave me the keys to the factory and they're like, what are you going to make? And I'm like, well, let's, let's make an Epi, let's make an Epiphone. um, Let's make a, uh, an Explorer because my first guitar was a pawn shop Explorer. So I wanted to pay homage to that. And then we made it kind of a little bit more metal. We like, we tightened the midsection a little bit. We, we kind of shortened the back horn so it didn't feel like it went forever. Um, put on a lot of mo- modern stuff like, you know, Floyd put in the EMG. I, I had an a, I had an endorsement with EMG at the time, so it was EMGs in there. And then um, I remember somebody on I was doing um, an interview somewhere, and it was online, and somebody said, um, "If you ever had a signature model, would you put a um, would you put a kill switch on there like Buckethead?" And I thought. Well, yeah, sure. Why, yeah, why not? Okay. So the uh, apparition had a, um, had a, uh, had a, okay, go ahead and find it, buddy. It's over there. It had a, um, a kill switch on it. Um, and I got the design, uh, the top. She's, uh, the, the logo was done by Ben Horton at Zero Skateboards. To, to, you know, the, 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 the cross size were supposed to look like an M for Marcus. Um, and Epiphone 
released that guitar with an $899 price point, and I was scared because I was like, that's really expensive for like, you know, a mid-level guitar. And they sold every single one of them. Like every apparition sold out completely. And I was just like, okay, I think, think, we've, think we nailed it on this one. So um, after that, I had a kid and we being my wife. And when Orion was born, they sent me over. Here, just bring it over here, bud. So he wants to show off his guitar. Um, yep. So Epiphone made a baby blue flying V. Check that out. It says Orion on the headstock. Oh, that's awesome. And, on the truss rod cover. And uh, yeah, and uh, they said they... They said they made a pink one for Tom Cruise's girl, Surrey Cruise, I think was her name, and they made a blue one for Orion. See, you're in an elite group right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, it's it's been a crazy ride, right? <laughs> so, I mean... Um, At the end of it all, at least me, you could say that uh, right? you know, you're like two degrees of separation from Tom Cruise. Well, and Epiphone and Gibson have been amazing. Like, I'm still very close to Al John, and and um, the the guy who signed me was literally the president of Epiphone at the time, um, Jim Rosenberg. And I'm still close with Jim and his family. I mean, metal metal and guitars are family, and um, it's just I, I I I'm I'm just speechless at what I've been able to to just accomplish with with how much people have believed in me. And um, just an incredibly lucky dude. That's all I can say. Well, Marcus, I um, I've really enjoyed this discussion. Um, this I I say this after every interview. I don't know why. I was like, this is my favorite one. This is the best one I've done. But this this has to be one of my favorite interviews. You're you're just such a legit, super nice dude. You had no reason to answer me, but you did. And uh, for that, I am forever grateful. Um, no, man, I'm grateful. Thank you for for giving me a chance to talk. I mean, um, it's it's a it's a shared experience. I feel like I said that it's it's really just something that I was I I had to do some heavy lifting and to be a part of it to to affect people emotionally or or bring any kind of happiness to their lives or or any joy. To, to, to carry on the torch of music, man. I, I, I think that music and hard rock and metal will survive forever, but it only survives when people share it with other people. It's like old folk tales. These things don't exist when people stop talking about them. So I'll, I'll be happy to share my experiences or talk about, you know, what's been, what's been gifted to me anytime I, I'm given an opportunity. So, so no, thank you, Bill. I really appreciate it, man. So um, before we, before I let you go here, where can people find you on social media? What, you know, uh, social media handles, whatever, how can people find you? Okay. So I decided a long time ago that I, I, I didn't really want to be found because when I was growing up, I was like, Hey man, Ozzy bit that I had to read about how Ozzy bit the head off a bat or something. And it was like, these were reclusive rock stars. And, and to me, the element of surprise and mystery is gone when people are tweeting about um, every facet of their lives. So I made a conscious decision that if, if, if I'm going to be involved in any kind of social media, it's not going to be invasive. And I don't want to be constantly selling people something just to be in their you know, atmosphere of thought all the time. So if you want to find me on social media, I'm really only on Facebook. I have an Instagram account, but I never post because – it's, it's a full-time job to try to capture people's attention. And I, I, I really don't want to be in your thought process on a day-to-day -day basis, but if you want to <laughs> hang out or you want to, you want to reach out to me or you want to chat about guitar, I'm happy to do so. Um, my Facebook is facebook.com slash tonally awesome, like totally awesome, but tonally. Oh, I see the wordplay there. So uh, tonally awesome is where I'm at. And, I will I will sign anything anytime for anybody. I I'll be happy to 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 chat about guitars or or metal or or anything anytime. Um, so yeah, hit me up and, and uh, reach out and um, befriend me and uh, let, let's go on this journey uh, to to discover and share metal and music and, and life and stories and laughter together. Right on, Marcus. Thank you very much for coming on, man. I cannot thank you enough. 
Um, ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Henderson. Thank you, Bill. Rage Against the Machine. Pos- what's, the, what's the name of the podcast again? Rage Against the Mainstream. Rage Against the Mainstream. Bill, you are the best. If you want me to promote your your uh, your podcast anytime, anywhere, just feel free. Let me know. I'm always here for you guys as well. So thank you again for everything today. And uh, I look forward to doing it again at some point when uh, the next game comes out. What was Orion's YouTube channel again? Orion's YouTube channel is called Orion's Galaxy. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> They're promoting your channel, dude. Yay! Orion's Galaxy on YouTube. Check it out, everybody. He's he's always the best. Bill, thank you so much for this opportunity to chat with you today, man. Thank you again for keeping rock and metal alive. And uh, yeah, it's it's just been awesome talking to you, man. Um, have a great summer, and uh, hope to catch up to you again soon. You too, man. Thank you. Anytime, brother. Take care. 